All right, uh, we'll begin the uh, final topic of the day. Um, influenza vaccines, um, Dr. Atmar uh, will uh, give the introduction. Uh, Dr. Atmar, if you please. Session of the day, we're gonna move from one respiratory virus to another. And here is our influenza work group. We have uh, several ACIP members that I need to thank, Dr. Alt, Bernstein, Salaji, and Talbot. And then also thank uh, our ex officio members, consultants, and liaison representatives that are here. Despite the large number of uh, people on our work group calls, it's a very functional and interactive group. Um, and uh, thanks to Lisa Groskoff for her leadership. Our fearless leader is able to shepherd us along and cover a number of different uh, topics. So a recap of uh, what we discussed uh, last October at the ACIP meeting. There was an overview of the early 2019-2020 uh, season of influenza activity. Um, there was a presentation from Sanofi Pasteur, a pre-licensure study of a quadrivalent high-dose inactivated influenza vaccine, the flu zone high-dose quadrivalent, that was subsequently licensed by the FDA um, in November. Um, and there was a discussion of a planned systematic review of influenza vaccines for older adults. Recent work group uh, discussion activities include those listed uh, on this slide. Um, there was a presentation and discussion of preliminary safety results from a comparative study of adjuvanted and high-dose inactivated vaccines among persons 60, 65 years of age and older. Um, there was a presentation from Securus of a pre-licensure study of quadrivalent adjuvanted inactivated influenza vaccine, the FluAD quadrivalent. Um, that was licensed by the FDA in uh, February, and we're going to hear a little bit more about that uh, during the session today. Um, and then there were a selection of efficacy and effectiveness and safety outcomes for review of uh, influenza vaccines for uh, older adults. So today, um, we're going to start off with uh, a presentation by Dr. Sylvester from Securus on uh, the adjuvanted quadrivalent influenza vaccine phase three uh, trial uh, results. And then uh, Ms. Bramer is gonna give us an update on uh, uh, surveillance uh, influenza activity um, for this season. Um, Dr. Flannery is gonna give interim estimates for seasonal influenza vaccine effectiveness against medically attended influenza from the US flu VE network. Um, Dr. Schmader is going to give us a presentation on the safety of adjuvanted versus high-dose inactivated flu vaccine uh, in older adults. This is a preliminary um, uh, report. And then we're, we're going to finish uh, the session um, with Dr. Groskopf giving us a summary of uh, work group uh, considerations and what uh, we hold in store going forward. So, Dr. Sylvester. Good afternoon. Thank you for the opportunity to present the results of our pivotal phase three trial, evaluating the efficacy of our adjuvanted quadrivalent influenza vaccine, also known as Fluad Quad. This vaccine, as just been pointed out, is now licensed in the US for persons 65 years and older. I will present a brief background for FLUAD, followed by the study design and objectives, the immunogenicity, the efficacy, and the study results, followed by a brief discussion um, of the study. MF59 adjuvanted trivalent influenza vaccine, or FLUAD trivalent, was licensed based on immunogenicity criteria and has been in use for over 20 years. It was first licensed in Europe in 1997, and Fluad trivalent was approved by the FDA in November 2015 for once again in the use of individuals 65 years and older. Several effectiveness studies have been conducted with Fluad trivalent and have provided evidence of clinical benefit 
compared to standard influenza vaccines. Because fluad trivalent was licensed under an accelerated pathway using immunogenicity results with the FDA, there was a post-marketing commitment that we needed to conduct an efficacy trial. So Securus negotiated with the FDA to fulfill this post-marketing commitment with a trial using the quadrivalent instead of the trivalent. And this is the study that I am presenting to you today. The trial was an absolute efficacy study in subjects 65 and older, conducted over two consecutive influenza seasons, one uh, the Northern Hemisphere 16-17 season and the other the Southern Hemisphere 2017. It's important to note that the predominant circulating strain during the study period was H3N2. Over 6,600 subjects were randomized one-to-one -to, -one to receive a 0.5 ml fluad quad or a non-influenza comparator, the combination vaccine of tetanus, diphtheria, and acellular pertussis, or Tdap, or Boostrix, the uh, trade name. This was a multi-center study conducted in 12 countries listed at the bottom of this slide. The study was case-driven, and to analyze the results, we needed at least 238 PCR confirmed cases to demonstrate the primary endpoint of the study, which was the efficacy of PCR confirmed influenza, regardless of the match of the virus with the vaccine strain, and with a lower bound of the 95% confidence limit greater than 40%. That's what we negotiated with Siever. We had secondary endpoints that included efficacy against strain antigenically matched to the vaccine strains for those isolates that were culture positive with that same lower bound of greater than 40%. We also evaluated a subset of participants for immunogenicity in both vaccine groups by hemagglutination inhibition assay three weeks after the vaccination. The primary safety objective was to evaluate the safety of fluad quad through the assessment of local and systemic solicited as well as unsolicited um, adverse events for the entire study period up to one year, and I will go through those results later in the study. This was a randomized observer-blinded study and you can see by the demographics that the two treatment groups were well matched. The majority were between the ages of 65 and 75 years of age. And given the countries where the study was performed, 80% of the subjects self-reported either being white or Asian. The comorbidity score at the bottom of the slide is based upon a published paper by Heck et al. in which a comorbidity score of less than 50 is predictive of a lower risk of influenza-related complications. This diagram shows the subject flow for the study. I pointed out that over 6,600 subjects were randomized one-to-one -one to receive 0.5 ml of fluid, quad, or Tdap. Blood samples from an approximately 2,800 subjects were collected at day one, the baseline, as you can see with the red arrow, and day 22 for immunogenicity assessment. As mentioned before, the primary and secondary objectives are listed at the bottom of this slide. I will now describe the results of immunogenicity, and then I'll follow that with efficacy and the safety results. Fluad quad elicited good HI titers for all strains. Between 60 and 85% of the subjects achieved at least a fourfold rise in titers, and 80% of the subjects demonstrated titers of greater or equal to one to 40 for HI which satisfied the CEBRA criteria for immunogenicity 
for all four strains. Now I want to describe the second half or the efficacy and safety results. But first I'd like to say a word about case accrual and the description of the influenza-like illness endpoint used in our study. In terms of case accrual, there was active surveillance for influenza. All subjects were contacted weekly for six months or until the end of the influenza season, whichever was longer, to assess ILI symptoms. The purpose of the active surveillance was to trigger a visit to collect a nasopharyngeal swab at or near the onset of these defined symptoms. We also evaluated cases based on different definitions of influenza-like illness as shown on this slide. The top two definitions were included as part of our protocol and the two definitions at the bottom of the triangle were added post hoc. The main differences between these definitions is the subject's temperature and the presence of symptoms more specific for influenza as you go down the triangle. This slide shows the ILI case accumulation for each of the four definitions shown on the left-hand side of the slide. You can see in the clinically defined ILI column that as you move from the top to the bottom through the different ILI definitions, the number of ILI cases go down. But as shown in the next column, the proportion of those cases that were PCR confirmed go up less sensitive, but more specific for flu. It is interesting to note that the number of cases that were similar to the vaccine strain were less than 10%, meaning 90% of the cases were dissimilar to the vaccine strain. This table shows the primary endpoint of the study the PCR confirmed influenza irrespective of vaccine strain, and that's the first row of this table. The protocol defined ILI definition showed an efficacy of about 20% with a lower bound of the 95% confidence interval at less than 40. So per CBER criteria, a non-significant result. As the ILI definition increased in specificity for influenza, as you go down the table, the efficacy increases up to 50%. For strains similar to the vaccine, the range of the vaccine efficacy was much higher, 50 to 75%. But with so few cases that match the vaccine strains, the confidence limits are extremely wide, and we need to be cautious about drawing inferences from these data. Now to the safety. In terms of safety, we recorded local adverse events within that first week. And the FluAd quad arm had higher rates compared to the Tdap arm. These events were mostly mild to moderate and self-limited. The most commonly reported local solicited adverse event was injection site pain. You can see that on the right of the slide. Administration of Fluad Quad was also associated with a higher rate of frequency of the systemic solicited adverse events, and that occurred within the first week of the study, compared to the control vaccine. The most frequent reported systemic adverse events in both groups were headache, fatigue, myalgia, and arthralgia. Severe systemic solicited adverse events were uncommon and varied between 0 to 1.1% of the subjects in our flu ad group, and 0.2% to 0.6% of subjects in the booster group.
During the one-year follow-up, there were no differences between the vaccine groups and the percentage of any of the unsolicited serious adverse events. Unsolicited adverse events leading to death and unsolicited adverse events leading to premature withdrawal from the study or any new onset of chronic diseases and adverse events of special interest. Two subjects reported serious adverse events that were assessed to be related to the study vaccines. Rheumatoid arthritis in the FLUAD group and a myocardial infarction in the DTaP group. With regards to the rheumatoid arthritis case, it was assessed that it was related to the study vaccine by the investigator. There were no vaccine deaths related to the vaccine. There were no deaths related to the vaccine. As I have mentioned before, the primary endpoint of the study, PCR-confirmed influenza, showed a vaccine efficacy of 20%, a non-significant result. But as the ILI definition became more specific, including higher levels of temperature, the efficacy increases up to 50%. To provide some context to these results, let me show you vaccine effectiveness data during the time period this study was conducted. There have been multiple published test negative design studies from both the Northern and Southern hemispheres showing fairly low vaccine effectiveness in subjects 65 years and older and around the 20% against all strains. I've highlighted just a few here on this slide. When it comes to study limitations, the study was relatively short over the course of a little bit over a year, over the two seasons, and it was dominated just by one uh, circulating strain, the influenza A, H3N2. There's a wide range of circulating antigenically and genetically different strains for that H3N2, and as I've shown you, 90% of the culture-confirmed influenza isolates were antigenically different to the strains in our vaccine. I also showed you that in the demographics that the study population was relatively healthy. So in conclusion, FLUAD elicited a robust immune response for all four strains, satisfying the CBER criteria for immunogenicity. The FLUAD's vaccine efficacy results were 19.8 up to 50% depending on the ILI definition and the symptomatology. And FLUED had an expected and acceptable tolerability profile similar to our trivalent vaccine. And as it's been pointed out, FLUED received FDA licensure last Friday, February 21st, 2020. That concludes my presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much for that presentation. Questions for Dr. Phil Sylvester? Uh, yes, please, Dr. Talbot. I have a couple questions. On slide 15, when you look at the increasing efficacy, um, my suspicion is with the increasing temperature requirement that you are dropping off your old of your old. You know, and so you're not the first person to mention that. <laughs> and you know, we're, we, we believe in, in, in um, um, our, our aging process uh, of um, as you get older, you, you're going to lose some of that. And we, we looked at the difference in the two age groups to see if there was a difference and don't see a difference. But I, but I take your point. I, I understand what you're saying. Yeah, it would be interesting to, to look at them side by side. Um, and then my second question is slide 24 with the different circulating viruses. I'm assuming this is what has just been posted for the world circulation. Do you oh, have and, your and so own? that's actually my backup slide. So I, okay. I it's in your thing and it's that. Yeah, so that, that is not a, a US data, that, that's uh, larger data. Yeah, this is data from all over the world. What, is you, what do your samples look like, your sequencing? Um, I, I mean, we showed 10% only matching, so we do see a wide variety, but I don't have a, a graph similar to that to show you what ours looked like. So, do you have any 
quantification of I, I don't, but I'd be happy to go back to my clinical colleagues and see if Great. I can get that for you. Thanks. Mm -hmm. My pleasure. Any other comments or questions? Uh, Dr. Atmar. Just a question about the case of RA, uh, rheumatoid arthritis, in, in your FLUAD group. Uh, was that patient in the immunogenicity um, subgroup? And if so, were the pre-vaccination sera evaluated for markers of RA? I, I don't know the answer to that. The diagnosis was made seven months and one week after he, he received the vaccine. It was a white male, 68 years old. But I will take that back also and see if he was part of our blood drawing group. Thank you. Dr. Whitney Williams. Pat Whitley Williams, National Medical Association. So thank you for your presentation. It was a little bit disappointing that no, almost no African Americans were or black population was involved in the study. Um, any comments about that? I mean, obviously you, you disclosed the countries, I understand that, but um, given the diversity of this country um, and the persons who would be eligible for this vaccine, and also given the um, health disparities that exist, particularly with regards to flu vaccine and complications, it's a little bit di uh, disappointing that there, was, there were not efforts to include uh, more uh, black, pop, uh, black population. And I agree with you. We, we, as moving forward, we are trying to elicit either countries or looking in the United States to be able to have our representative sample. Other comments or questions? Thank you very much. Thank you. So our next speaker is uh, Ms. Lynette uh, Brammer. Thank you and good afternoon. Um, this afternoon I'll present our surveillance data from the 2019-2020 influenza season. We've had another busy um, and unusual influenza season this year. Um, the slides that I'm showing are through MMWR week number seven, which was the week ending February 15th. Um, the data on the left shows information from our clinical laboratories, and you can see that influenza Bs, which are shown as the green part of the bar, were predominant early in the season, and the influenza A viruses, which are shown in yellow, um, increased as the season progressed. Um, as of week seven, 29.6% of specimens during that week were positive for influenza, and 63.5% were influenza A viruses. If you look on the right, that's the more detailed data from our public health laboratories. Um, during week seven, 64.9% of the viruses reported by the public health labs were influenza A, um, and that proportion has been increasing. For the season overall, it was a little over 50% influenza A. Um, among the influenza A's for during weeks um, 7, 96% of those were influenza A, H1N1, PDM09 viruses. For the season overall, that proportion is 91%. Among the influenza B's, the vast majority, or 98%, have belonged to the B Victoria lineage. This next slide shows our outpatient data. Um, it's outpatient visits for influenza-like illness. Um, on the left, it shows the proportion of patient visits that were for influenza-like illness. Um, we went above baseline for the first time during weeks, um, during the week ending November 9th, so the first full week of November, and have now been above baseline for 15 weeks. We've had two peaks. The first occurred during the last week of 2019 when 7.1% of patient visits were for influenza-like illness. And then we've had a second slightly smaller peak during weeks five and six, which was the big, very 
last week of January and first week of February, um, when 6.7% of patient visits were for influenza-like illness. The map on the right shows the state level influenza-like illness data for week seven. Um, during that week, we had 44 states, New York City and Puerto Rico still at high levels of influenza-like illness, um, similar to the previous week, and only one state lower than the peak um, during week four. Sorry, week five. Um, so we had a lot of influenza-like illness, and if you look on a population level at the overall hospitalization rate, during week seven, that cumulative rate had um, risen to 47.4 influenza lab-confirmed hospitalizations per 100,000 population. And if you compare it to the other years, this year is the red line, um, it's higher than some, but not particularly high. And if you look on the right, that's our um, hospitalizations among persons 65 and older. So you can see their rate this year of 116.7 is really what's, their, their rate is relatively low compared to other seasons. However, if you look at children, you get a very different picture. Um, the graph on the left shows children age zero to four years. And you can see this season shown in red, um, the cumulative rate so far um, is 72.5 per 100,000. This is above what we saw at the end of season for both 17, 18, and 18, 19 seasons, and just below the same week um, during the second wave of the 2009 pandemic. Um, for the children 5 to 17 year old, years old, they are, again, higher than any other seasonal influenza season um, for this point of time and approaching the 18, 19, um, and 17, 18 end of season rates, but still well below the pandemic rate. Um, adults. 18 to 49 years of age also have relatively high hospitalization rates. Their rate for this time for the same week is higher than any other seasonal um, influenza season, and but still a bit below the 17-18 season, which was their high season. And for adults 50 to 64, they're starting to look more like the 65 and older group um, with the hospitalization rates below well below the 17-18 season and the 18-19 season. If you look at pneumonia and influenza associated mortality from the National Center for Health Statistics, um, PNI mortality has been relatively low this year. Um, we have been above the threshold for only three weeks and that amount above the threshold has been fairly small. Um, the peak thus far was 7.5% during the first week of this year compared to the threshold of 7.0%. However, if you look at influenza-associated pediatric deaths, you do also see a different picture. Um, thus far this year, we've had 105 influenza-associated pediatric deaths and unfortunately, it doesn't look like the rate of reporting of those deaths is slowing any yet. Um, for children that, um, that we have information, um, 72 of those deaths were due to influenza B viruses. All of the ones, all 12 that were lineage tested belong to the B Victoria lineage. Um, and we've had 33 influenza A deaths. 19 of those that were subtyped were H1, and we had one subtyped as H3. Um, typically, approximately, or around 20% of these children are vaccinated against influenza, um, and this year is running about the same or a little bit lower. 
So impact overall, this is our second year of providing weekly burden estimates um, as the season progresses. So between October 1st and February 15th, we have estimated that there have been at least 29 million flu illnesses, 13 million medical visits for influenza, 280,000 hospitalizations, and at least 16,000 deaths due to influenza. Going back to the viruses that have circulated this season, um, looking at the H1N1 viruses, all 100, 563 H1N1 viruses tested belong to the same genetic groups called 6B1A, although it, there is some genetic diversity within this subclade. Um, but if you look antigenically, all 74 of the viruses tested antigenically using a hemagglutination inhibition assay with ferret antisera were similar to the cell propagated A Brisbane 2 2018 reference virus representing this year's Northern Hemisphere vaccine component. Looking at the H3N2 viruses, which we've seen very few of this year, um, 365 of 381, or 95.8% of the H3N2 viruses belong to the 3C2A1 subclade. 16, or 4.2%, belong to the 3C3A clade, which was the clade that emerged last season and became predominant by the end of the season. Um, although the... Um, Majority of the viruses belong to the 3C2A1 subclade. 31 of 72, or 43% of the H3N2 viruses characterized by FRA were well inhibited by ferret antisera raised against the A Kansas 14 2017 3C3A reference virus that is representing the um, H3N2 component of this year's vaccine, showing that even. Um, Using very specific ferret antisera, there is some degree of cross-reactivity between these two genetic groups of viruses. Moving on to the influenza B Victoria lineage viruses. During this season, we've only seen two of the genetic groups of B Victoria virus co-circulating, the V1A1, which was the virus with a two amino acid deletion um, relative to the V1A viruses and the V1A3, which had a three amino acid um, deletion. Um, 50 of 655 or 7.6 percent of the B Victoria lineage viruses belong to the V1A1 subclade. The remaining 605 belong to the V1A3 subclade, and the B Colorado 6 2017 reference virus representing the B Victoria component of this year's vaccine belongs to the V1A1 subclade. But again, even though the majority of the viruses are on a in a ge different genetic group than the vaccine, 60.2% of the B Victoria lineage viruses antigenically characterized by HI using ferret antisera were similar to the cell-propagated B Colorado 6 2017-like V1A1 reference virus indicating that, again, there is cross-reactivity between these genetic groups among the B. victorias, similar to the H3N2 viruses. And finally, to wrap this up, the B. Yamagata lineage viruses, um, we saw very, very few of these this year. All of them belong to a single genetic group, the Y3 genetic group. All of the B. Yamagata lineage viruses antigenically characterized um, are similar to the B. Phuket 3073-2013 reference virus representing the Yamagata lineage in this year's vaccine. Um, vaccine strain selection or vaccine virus selection for the 2021 season is happening at WHO as we speak. Actually, they've probably gone to dinner by now. Um, but that will be announced Friday morning. I believe it's at 4 a.m. our time. Um, and then that will be followed on March 4th by a meeting of FDA's Vaccine and Related Biological Products 
committee who will make the U.S. specific recommendations for next year's vaccine. So to summarize, influenza activity remains elevated here in the U.S. Um, B. Victoria lineage viruses predominated early, but the H1N1 PDM09 viruses have increased in recent weeks, and for the season, we're basically even between the B. Victoria and the H1N1 viruses. Overall, severity has been low, but the hospitalization rates among children and young adults have been unusually high. And so far, we've had 105 influenza-associated deaths in children. So that's I, the conclusion of my presentation. Um, Dr. Flannery is going to present on the vaccine effectiveness for this year. And if it's okay with the committee, we'll take questions after both presentations. That is very acceptable. Great, good afternoon. Uh, so I have um, created this sheet just to put the genetic groups of the vaccine strains together with the names. Uh, it's getting a little bit confusing uh, with the genetic groups that we're referring to in these presentations. Uh, uh, if you prefer to have the names of the vaccines as in old times, uh, they're there for reference. Uh, we'll be talking a little bit about this uh, 6B1A group in the H1N1 uh, category, uh, as well as the V1A1 group that uh, Dr. Brammer, uh, Ms. Brammer mentioned with uh, the double deletion uh, in the vaccine. So those are the two to kind of pay attention to here. Um, these are data from the U.S. Flu VE network. Uh, the five sites for the uh, cooperative agreement with the CDC are shown here with the principal investigators for each site. Um, the, the methods are the same as have been used previously for our interim estimates. And just as a reminder for some of you uh, and, and new information for others, um, the uh, case definition includes acute respiratory illness with a cough. Uh, so it's a more sensitive uh, case definition uh, for surveillance than the ILI definition, uh, CDC ILI definition that includes fever. Uh, we enroll outpatients at, at these five sites or clinics associated with these five sites who are six months and, ol and older. Uh, this period goes through only January 25th. Uh, so the data include enrollment from October 23rd through January 25th. The test negative design that we use compares vaccination odds among our test positives uh, to the vaccination odds in the test negatives. Uh, the vaccination status for these interim reports is based on at least one dose of the current season vaccine. We determine vaccination status based on a combination of vaccination records uh, and medical records as well as a, a self-report at some sites for these interim estimates. Um, we, we do not have data on a vaccine type specific VE. We'll have that at the end of the season when these documented records are all available. Uh, we can say that the vast majority of the vaccinated people in this uh, uh, data set have received some type of injectable in, in, inactivated vaccine and not uh, live attenuated vaccine. We had fewer than 10 children uh, in this data set with live attenuated vaccine, so we do not have any estimates for live attenuated vaccine at this time. Uh, the uh, adjusted estimates uh, have, uh, the adjustments are listed at the bottom, study site, age, sex, self-rated general health status, race, ethnicity, and interval from onset to enrollment, as well as a two-week interval for calendar time. Uh, those are included in all of the estimates. So there are 4,112 enrolled during this period at 52 clinics and five sites. Uh, about 26% tested flu positive. Uh, the 74% is our control group there. Uh, the distribution of type and subtype are shown in the pie graph. Uh, as uh, Dr. Brammer showed, Ms. Brammer showed from the beginning of the season, we had more B. Victoria circulating during this period than H1N1. Uh, since that time, we've had more H1N1 than B. Victoria. 
but those have uh, continued to be the prominent influenza viruses circulating in the VE network sites. Um, this is more of a snapshot of where the enrollment was at that time through the 25th of January. Um, but the black line shows the percent positivity, and it just as a reminder, uh, these are just people coming in with acute respiratory illness of all age, and flu, laboratory confirmed flu, accounts for more than 40% of all acute respiratory illness in these clinics uh, during the peak of the season, and we're, we're maintaining about 40% positivity for enrollment currently. Um, this first table shows the overall estimates of vaccine effectiveness against any influenza. About uh, reading across the top row, about 37% of the influenza positives were vaccinated. About 55% of the influenza negatives were vaccinated. Uh, the unadjusted estimate was 53%, and after adjustment, the overall vaccine effectiveness at this interim estimate is 45%. Uh, with a confidence interval from 36 to 53. We do see some age difference, age group difference in vaccine effectiveness. The estimates for 18 to 49 year olds uh, are 25%. They're all three age specific estimates are statistically significant, um, but we'll say more about that 18 to 49 year old group in a moment. Um, the first estimates here on the next slide are for uh, B. Victoria. Uh, the overall estimate for B. Victoria was 50%. Uh, the six month to 17 year old estimate is 56%. And the 18 and over estimate has been combined because we had f too few cases in the 50 and older group to separate that out. So we really see a shift in the dis age distribution of influenza B at the study sites towards the younger population. The estimate in 18-year-older was a, a, a bit lower at 32%, uh, but still statistically significant. At the bottom of the slide, we do have some of the sequencing that's been done for viruses that are collected from the flu VE network. Out of the 670 uh, flu positives, 262 B. Victoria viruses were sequenced. Almost all of them, 98%, were in the triple deletion group, that V1A3, that is the Southern Hemisphere vaccine component for 2020, but is not the genetic group of the um, a, a, a B virus, the V1A1 virus that's in our current vaccine. Uh, this, this slide is the H1N1 specific vaccine effectiveness. Overall, the vaccine effectiveness was 37%. The confidence intervals from 19 to 52%. The um, uh, age-specific estimates show a great deal of difference from two significant estimates, 51% uh, in six months to 17-year-olds and 50% in 50 and older, but 5% and not significant for the 18 to 49-year-olds. At the bottom of the slide, there are the data from uh, our sequencing, uh, it's not very informative in that at this level, the sequencing identifies all of the viruses from the flu VE network, all the H1N1 viruses, as belonging to the vaccine genetic group 6B1A. Um, but there has been some variety in the H1N1 uh, viruses that are circulating. Uh, we don't know if that's related to this lower vaccine effectiveness among the 18 to 49-year-olds at this point. Um, these data from the U.S. were published last week in the MMWR. Uh, in, in Euro surveillance last week, our colleagues from Canada presented the VE estimates for the 1920 season from Canada. I just want to point out three estimates from this uh, table. One is the estimates for influenza B. Uh, this includes all influenza B, but the vast majority are B. Victoria. Um, they are slightly higher than our estimates uh, for influenza B, uh, but they're uh, 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 comparably reassuring in that the vaccine in Canada does seem to provide protection against the majority B. Victoria virus that is the triple deletion and not the virus that's in uh, the Northern Hemisphere vaccine formulation. The second piece of data that from this table that is important is that they did have enough H3N2 in their surveillance network to provide an all ages and a 20 to 64 year old estimate for H3N2. 
the main H3N2 virus, like in the United States, is not the uh, 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 subclade or clade that's in the vaccine, the 3C3A. They are seeing, as in the U.S., a majority of 3C2A1 virus. Uh, so again, evidence that vaccine is providing some protection despite circulation of a virus that's actually different than the genetic group, at least, that's in the vaccine. Uh, and finally, the H1N1 estimates here that are uh, different than what we see in the U.S. flu VE network at this point. Their all-ages estimate was 44, which is very similar to our all-ages estimate. 1 to 19-year-olds is 63. The two, 20 to 64-year-olds has an estimate of 39%, which although slightly lower than, than uh, in previous seasons in Canada and, and the 1 to 19-year-olds, is higher and statistically significant than what we see in the U.S. flu VE network. The other thing to put this in context is the uh, pyramid from the website that shows over the past 10 years or since the pandemic, the number of deaths, the number of hospitalizations, and the number of illnesses that occur uh, in each influenza season. Um, those uh, higher limits are from the 1718 season shown in the table on the right. The last season had 35 million estimated illnesses, uh, almost half a million hospitalizations and 34,000 deaths. Uh, the deaths averted, uh, hospitalizations averted, and cases averted by vaccination last season were published uh, in January uh, in clinical infectious diseases. Uh, I just want to point out from the table that end of season vaccine effectiveness for the 18-19 season was around 26%. Uh, we saw very low effectiveness against H3 uh, that predominated for half of the season, despite that relatively low effectiveness, uh, kind of disappointingly low effectiveness. We see these numbers of uh, deaths averted, hospitalizations averted, and cases averted that are still substantial. Uh, we will expect estimates from the 1920 season sometime this fall. Uh, in summary, the interim estimates from the 1920 season indicate vaccine reduced medically attended illness due to any influenza virus by 45% based on enrollment through January 25th. We do see encouraging uh, signs of uh, vaccine effectiveness against any influenza in children who, uh, as Ms. Brammer noted, have been particularly hit hard by influenza this season. Vaccination provided 50% protection against the predominant influenza B Victoria virus that is from that a triple deletion clade V1A3. Uh, overall effectiveness against H1N1 was 37%. And as H1N1 circulation has increased since January, we do expect that we'll have better estimates, more precise estimates, uh, to investigate age-specific differences in, in H1N1 this, later this season. Uh, there are a lot of people to thank, but I'd like to specifically highlight uh, the work by Fatima Dawood, who wrote the MMWR, that was published last week, and the work of Jesse Chung, who is the data manager for the VE network, uh, and all of our contributors listed here. Thank you very much. So I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Bram I'm sorry, Ms. Brammer and uh, Dr. Flannery for their presentations and open them up for questions. Dr. Lee. Thank you so much. I One question I have uh, for you is, and part of my Part of my challenge is I'm always challenged by the test negative design, so um, if you could just help me think through this. Is the reason for the lower effectiveness rate in the 18 to 49 year old, does it have anything to do with like household vaccination rates? So do we know anything about are these parents of kids who are vaccinated and that might somehow influence the estimates for that age group? Yeah, the, the test negative design doesn't really account for indirect effects. Uh, and indirect effects are relatively hard to measure. But it is a pretty good design for individual effects of mm -hmm. the vaccine. So the, the main reason for the test negative design is to control for differences in the population in health-seeking behavior among those who are vaccinated and those who are not vaccinated. So if we do have individual protection of influenza vaccine, we should see it with this design, uh, even if there's a large indirect effect of that age group, uh, say having more exposure to young children or uh, where the vaccine is less likely to work because they have some intense exposure. And just to put this in, in perspective for last year's H1N1 estimates, mm -hmm. 
in that same age group, we actually saw good effectiveness last year. So we did have a, a change in the vaccine virus. Uh, we had a change in what was circulating, uh, but we did have eff effectiveness of H1N1 for last year's vaccine at this time, uh, but, but we don't see it this year. So. Okay. May, sorry, may I ask one more question? Yes, please, <laughs> it's go ahead. Ms. Brammer. Um, one, the other question I had was around the infant uh, deaths, and I'm wondering if there's any, uh, if it looks similar to prior years where approximately 50% of those infants were actually completely healthy, um, or if you have any information about, you know, what proportion had comorbidities. This year is similar to previous years where it's around 50%. Um, it's actually 53.5% this year had no previous medical conditions. Thank you. Dr. Bernstein. Um, assuming I understood that um, the B. Victoria strain that's uh, circulating was not matching the vaccine strain well, yet the vaccine effectiveness in children was 55% in the younger age group. Is there an explanation for that or did I misunderstand? No, so the point that I didn't make in the discussion is that the B. Victoria vaccine effectiveness this season with that difference in the genetic group of what's circulating from what's in the vaccine is similar. It's in the same range as the vaccine effectiveness that we've seen against B. Victoria in seasons where it's been well matched. So it's difficult when you say that it's not matched because that's usually based on antigenic differences. And as, as Ms. Brammer showed, the antigenic differences are not so clear in this, um, in the comparison. The majority of the viruses that have been antigenically characterized, or 60%, still show as uh, similar to the vaccine virus. So there's obviously some cross activity, and that's that's good news for for children. I think is the the, the it is bit a bit surprising that the vaccine effectiveness against B. Victoria is as high as it is in children with both the severity of the season and with the the um, vaccine uh, being different than what's circulating. But at this point, it's reassuring that the vaccine is providing protection low vaccine effectiveness uh, can't be said to be contributing to the particularly bad season. We are seeing some protection. Thank you. Dr. Fry. Thanks. <clears throat> Sorry, I may have missed this, but did uh, of the children that died, do we know uh, how many of those children were actually vaccinated? Yeah. Um, among the children that died, the vaccination rate is very similar to what we've seen in previous seasons where only about 20% of the children are vaccinated. Um, through week seven, with the limited information that we have, it's actually 16.6% so far through this year. Are there additional questions or comments? Okay, thank you all. Thank you both very much for your presentations. So we'll move on to the next uh, presentation, which is Dr. Schmader um, in safety adjusted versus high dose inactivated influenza vaccines in older adults. Good afternoon. It's uh, my pleasure to present the results of this uh, study safety of adjuvanted versus high dose inactivated influenza vaccines in older adults. Uh, this work was uh, supported by the CDC through the Clinical Immunization Safety um, uh, Assessment Project in collaboration with Duke as a lead site, Boston, and Cincinnati Children's Hospital Medical Centers. And note the CDC disclaimer there. And I want to acknowledge the outstanding work of the investigators at uh, Duke, Boston, Cincinnati, and the CDC. As, as you know, doing research during the flu season is difficult. Um, and I really want to point out, um, I think a special recognition to Dr. Chip Walter, who says hello to all his former committee members, Wes Roundtree, Chris Todd and Sue Doyle at Duke, Elizabeth Barnett, uh, Christine Liu, Heidi Arbach at Boston, and Liz Schlotteker at Cincinnati, and of course, Drs. Teresa Harrington and Karen Broder at the CDC. 
So this slide is the rationale behind the study, basically to prevent influenza in older persons. As you know, the ACIP recommends vaccination with any U.S. licensed age-appropriated appropriate influenza vaccine. So the trivalent high dose, HD IV3 flu zone high dose, and adjuvanted AIV3 flu ad influenza vaccines are licensed for use only in persons age 65 and older in the U.S. and may have improved effectiveness against standard dose vaccine. So clinicians and patients have an important choice to make, right? Uh, and an important factor in making that choice is safety and reactionicity. However, the comparative safety of these two vaccines has not been compared directly head-to-head -head in the same clinical trial in the United States. And furthermore, the relative impact of the two vaccines on health-related quality of life has not been studied, and that's a novel component of this uh, study. And of course, when I mention high-dose and adjuvanted flu vaccines throughout the rest of the talk, I'm talking about the trivalent products. All right, so the primary study objective was to compare the proportions of moderate to severe injection site pain after the adjuvanted and high-dose vaccines. We selected this as a primary objective because injection site pain would likely be causally related to the vaccine. And pain that is moderate, that's defined as some limitation in normal daily activity, or severe, defined as completely unable to perform normal daily activity, is obviously clinically meaningful. The hypothesis was that the proportion of subjects who have moderate to severe injection site pain within the first week post-vaccination will be non-inferior, that is not higher, for adjuvanted vaccine compared to high-dose vaccine. And the rationale for the non-inferior analysis lay in the fact that the adjuvanted vaccine was licensed in 2015 as the first adjuvanted influenza vaccine used in the U.S., whereas high-dose uh, vaccine was selected as a comparator because it had been licensed in the U.S. since 2010 and at the time of the study was in wide use and we had substantive evidence supporting its safety. The co-primary study objective was to compare serious adverse events, or SAEs, and events of adverse events of clinical interest after the two vaccines in the study population, and by age groups, 65 to 79 years and 80 years or older. And because of time limitations, I, I'm just going to present the results in the full study population and not the age group analyses. The secondary objectives were to compare the proportions of local and systemic reactions and uh, compare change in health-related quality of life after adjuvanted and high-dose vaccines. Let's move on to the study design. This was a randomized blinded clinical trial during the 2017-18 and 2018-19 influenza seasons at the three medical centers I mentioned earlier. The participants were community-dwelling elders over 65 and above with the main eligibility criteria, uh, including not being immunosuppressed, being cognitively intact, no co-vaccination, no influenza vaccine contraindications. And we sought to enroll at least 20% or more uh, individuals 80 years or older. The participants were randomized one-to-one -to, -one to receive 0 0.5 mils IM dose of adjuvanted or high-dose vaccine and stratified by those age groups. For the safety and reactionicity assessments, participants were monitored in clinic uh, for 15 or more minutes post-vaccination for adverse events, including syncope. Solicited reactionicity events and unsolicited adverse events were assessed using a standard symptom diary. Starting in day one, that's the vaccination day through day eight. SAEs were assessed during day one through day 43 post-vaccination. And the adverse events of clinical interest included syncope uh, during clinic post-vaccination monitoring, anaphylaxis in the first 24 hours after vaccination, Guillain-Barre syndrome within 43 days post-vaccination, and new onset immune-mediated conditions within 43 days post-vaccination. For the health-related quality of life assessments we used in both seasons of the main measure, uh, the EuroQual Five Dimensions Five Level, or EQ5D5L, this measures mobility, self-care, usual activities, pain, discomfort, and anxiety, depression on five different levels, ranging from no problems up to extreme problems. And the responses are converted to a utility index summary measure, which ranges from minus 0 0.109, that's the worst health, to 1.000, the best health. And we also use the EuroQual Visual Analog Scale, or EQVAS. This is a self-rated health measure in a thermometer format on a zero to 100 scale, with 100 being the best imaginable health state and zero being the worst health state 
in the participant's uh, estimation on that day. All right, the sample size estimate was 668 participants, that's 334 per group, which assumed 5% of older adults had moderate to severe injection site pain after either vaccine, and that's based on pre-licensure data. A clinically meaningful, in our estimation, non-inferiority margin of 5%, a one-sided alpha of 0.025, and at least 80% power to demonstrate the proportion of moderate to severe pain was non-inferior after the adjuvanted vaccine versus the high-dose vaccine. And here are the statistical tests uh, that are well documented on this slide. The main point I want to make here is that for the primary outcome of moderate to severe injection site pain, we used a one-sided alpha of 0.025 level, upper bound of a binomial confidence interval, and a non-inferiority margin of 5%. All right, let's go on to the results. Here's a study consort diagram. There are 778 participants were assessed for eligibility. 21 were excluded, 13 did not meet eligibility criteria, and eight were declined to participate. So 757 were randomized. The full analysis population were individuals who were randomized, vaccinated, and had at least one day of symptom diary data. And this population was used for SAE, uh, Adverse Events of Clinical Interest and in HRQL analyses. The full analysis population one were individuals who were randomized and vaccinated. And this is for injection site pain and all other reactions. So we had two people missing uh, symptom diary data in the high dose group. So there ended up being 377 for that group. This slide shows the summary of participants enrolled and randomized by site. And the main point here is that note that 21.5% of the participants were uh, 80 years or older, which met our goal of 20% or more. And here's a, a brief capsule of demographic characteristics with the characteristic um, on the left there, the adjuvant in the middle and the high dose in the far column. So the median age was 72. Uh, female was 56 to 54 percent, very similar in both groups. And just for reference, in the general U.S. population over age 65 from 2018 data, it's 56 uh, percent is female. Race white was 76 to 80 percent and black 15 to 18 percent. Again, for reference, in the general U.S. population over 65, 77 percent white and 13 percent black. Uh, we measured 15 other chronic medical conditions, cardiovascular, respiratory, and others in older adults, and they were equally balanced between the two groups. All right, here's the primary outcome results for injection site pain. The adjuvant there is in the top row, the high dose in the bottom row. And then you see the number and percents of none, mild, moderate, and severe pain in the columns. And at the far uh, right there, the moderate, severe pain combined uh, in the column. I want to point out the majority of individuals, 75 to 78 percent, reported no injection site pain. And then when you look at the non moderate to severe pain, the adjuvant was 3.2 percent and the high dose was 5.8 percent. So for the non inferiority uh, analysis, we calculate the percent difference of adjuvant minus high dose, which is minus 2.7 percent. The upper limit of the 95 percent confidence interval was 0.36 percent, but the non inferiority margin was 5. So we can say the proportion of participants with moderate to severe injection site pain after the adjuvant vaccine was not inferior, that is not higher than the proportion after the high dose vaccine. Here's the co-primary objective. Uh, no SAEs were determined to be related to the vaccination. Also, there were no significant difference in the proportion of SAEs between the vaccine groups. There are nine participants in the adjuvanted group and three participants in the high dose group with those confidence intervals overlapped, as you can see there, and no adverse events of clinical interest occurred. This slide uh, shows the proportion of moderate to severe local reactions after the two vaccines. It's a bar graph with the percent of participants with each reaction. The blue bar is adjuvant, the red bar is high dose. Uh, injection site pain is shown again, we've gone over that results, but also redness, shoulder pain on the side of vaccination, swelling and tenderness. And note that the absolute differences are small between these groups. Uh, in fact, the largest difference was only 3.7% in swelling, which was higher in the high dose group. Uh, tenderness did not meet the non-inferiority criteria while all the other reactions did, and none of these local reactions led to a medical visit. All right, here's the same kind of uh, figure, except for uh, moderate to severe systemic reactions after the two vaccines. The blue bar was adjuvant, the red bar high dose. 
Reactions are chills, diarrhea, fever, headache, myalgia, nausea, vomiting, arthralgia, fatigue, and malaise. Again, the absolute differences are small between the groups. The largest difference was fatigue with 3.1%, which is higher than the adjuvant group. Arthralgia, fatigue, and malaise did not meet non-inferiority criteria. Uh, the other reactions did. And no systemic reactions led to a medical visit. All right, let's move on to the last of uh, the secondary objectives, the health-related quality of life analyses. And this is showing change in, uh, from score from day one pre-vaccination to day three post-vaccination. So we're comparing the differences between the two groups. For the EQ5D5L, uh, the adjuvant group is in the top row, the high-dose group in the bottom row, and then the mean score is the utility index in day one and day two, and the resulting difference with 95% confidence intervals. The difference of minus 0, uh, 0.05 was the exact same between the two groups. Obviously, no significant difference. I'll also point out that note that the scores go up, they go up slightly for the groups, and higher scores are better, but those differences are not clinically meaningful. And if you look at the uh, Euroqual visual analog scale, it's the same table format. The difference was minus 2.22 in the adjuvanted group versus the difference of minus 2.45 in the high dose group. Again, no significant uh, between group difference. You go up slightly again, again, not clinically meaningful. And I'll point out, look at the pre-vaccination mean day scores for the, the uh, visual analog scale being the 85 range and that uh, for the utility index of 0.89 and 0 0.90 means that this is a relatively healthy independent group of elders. So in summary, the proportion of participants with moderate to severe injection site pain was not higher after adjuvanted vaccine and high-dose vaccine. There were no vaccine-related SAEs. The short-term post-vaccination health-related quality of life is not affected by either vaccine. Uh, the safety findings in our study were consistent with pre-licensure data for both vaccines, and uh, from the standpoint of safety, either vaccine is an acceptable option for the prevention of influenza in older adults. And with that, I conclude the presentation, and thanks for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Schmader. Uh, questions from the co committee? Dr. Salaji. Yeah, thanks for a nice presentation. Could I, I was just wondering, um, was there a reason for the fact that the population was quite healthy, um, or did that just happen? Yeah, absolutely. It's very typical in vaccine trials in older adults. You're getting community-dwelling volunteers. People from the nursing home don't volunteer for this. It is a recurring issue. I don't mean to be facetious about it, and Kip can tell you, too, from the work she's done. Because it's possible to recruit them. It's just harder. It's, it's hard. Harder. It's very hard to recruit those individuals. And I do a lot of clinical trials in older adults, not just in vaccines, but drugs. And uh, it's a major hole in the literature in general. Thanks for bringing that up, by the way. Dr. Talbot. Um, really nicely done. Um, and I have a random question, which you may not have the power to, to look at in the study, but um, were you able to look at immunogenicity and reactogenicity to see if there was actually a correlation? Yeah, thanks, Kip. That's a great point. Um, the immunogenicity studies are going on right now. There was also an immunogenicity arm to this. Uh, and hopefully in a, 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 couple, a month or two, we'll have all those results and we can do that analysis. Any other questions or comments? Thank you very much. Right, thank you. So our final presentation will be by Dr. Groskopf on uh, the summary and work group considerations. Good afternoon, thanks very much. Um, before beginning, I want to acknowledge um, a number of folks, um, including the, the CDC staff that attend our work group calls on a regular basis and contribute a lot of, to our discussion and also a lot of data and information on ongoing studies, um, as well as others that have contributed to our discussion over the past several months. So I have two updates. Um, this is the briefer of the two of them. This is just a little bit on influenza vaccine distribution. And this is a slide that was supplied by Dr. Jeannie Santoli from ISD, and her, her colleagues have put this data together. Um, it's an update of a slide that we had um, 
one that was quite similar of at the October meeting. This summarizes influenza vaccine dose distribution for the current season and the previous three seasons. The current season, 1920, is the uppermost black line. Um, to sum it up, at least with the most current data, as of February 14th of this year, 174.1 million doses of influenza vaccine have been distributed in the U.S. And next, the larger of the updates, um, some updates on our discussion of influenza vaccines for older adults, uh, which you may have gathered from today's discussion and also from our presentations at the last meeting in October has been a major topic of conversation in the work group for several months now. Before starting, I know these are all familiar, but because we have so many of them in flu and uh, because they're going to figure heavily into the next few slides, just a brief orientation to the abbreviations. We have three main categories of influenza vaccines. The IIVs, or inactivated influenza vaccines, are our largest category. Within that, there are some specific types. CCIIV is the cell culture-based vaccine. AIIV, the adjuvanted inactivated influenza vaccine. And HDIIV, the high-dose inactivated influenza vaccine. The other two main categories, RIV, recombinant influenza vaccine, and LAIV, the live attenuated influenza vaccine. And as many of you are familiar with now, we, we use numeric suffixes to indicate the valence of the vaccine, three for trivalence and four for quadrivalence. For the slides that follow, most of what we were going to be discussing is the adjuvanted IIV, the high-dose IIV, and the RIV. So when we had our last summary at the end of the October meeting, we presented a discussion of the rationale and design for a sy systematic review of influenza vaccines in older adults uh, that had been discussed in the work group for a number of calls. And I'm not going to present all the slides from the rationale that we discussed at the time, but I'm just going to present this one just to reorient to why we're asking this question. Older adults, particularly for this conversation, those aged 65 years and over, are recognized as a group that's at increased risk for severe illness and complications due to influenza infection. They're also a group, as we've discussed, that tends not to have as good results in terms of efficacy or effectiveness with vaccines as compared to younger, healthier age groups. They also are the group age-wise that has the most in terms of number of influenza vaccines that are suitable for them, just purely based on age indications. We've had since 2013-14 a pretty decent expansion of the number of different types of influenza vaccines that are available. Uh, these include two that are licensed specifically for older adults, 65 and older. Those would be the adjuvanted, which is um, currently still this season, available as a trivalent vaccine, and the high-dose IIB, um, also trivalent this season. Uh, those are licensed specifically for 65 and older. The adjuvanted and the high dose, adjuvanted has MF59 adjuvanted. High dose has a higher antigen dose of the hemagglutinin antigen. Both of those are licensed for this age group in order to encourage a stronger immune response and, and better effectiveness or efficacy. Both adjuvanted and high dose inactivated vaccines have been studied as compared to unadjuvanted standard dose inactivated vaccines in this population. And for each vaccine, there's some evidence, depending on the study, uh, of better efficacy in this age group. There's also been at least one study of recombinant influenza vaccine, which was first licensed in 2013-14 um, as a trivalent and then became available as a quadrivalent in the 17-18 season. This is licensed for 18 and over, but has been st specifically studied in adults 50 and older in a randomized controlled trial compared to a quadrivalent inactivated vaccine. So for the older age group, 65 and up, we have a total out of our nine vaccines that are available this season, eight of which are appropriate by age indications. ACIP recommends specifically that a licensed age-appropriate influenza vaccine should be used, and we don't have a preferential recommendation made for any specific vaccine for any one age group where there's more than one that is appropriate, which is the case for many age groups, but particularly for 65 and older. So as was alluded to in, in Dr. Schmader's presentation, people do ask questions, providers ask questions, the public ask questions about whether or not one vaccine is more appropriate for any given person. So we discussed last time where we were in terms of development of a protocol for a systematic review of influenza vaccines for older adults. And the question is uh, that we posed and which ended up being pretty similarly when we finalized the protocol is whether the relative benefits and harms of HDIIV 
AIIV and RIIV, as compared with one another and with other influenza vaccines, favor the use of any one or more of these vaccines over other age-appropriate vaccines for persons greater than or equal to 65 years of age. So that's our question. Relatively complicated one because we have a, a good number of vaccine comparisons embedded in there. So this slide shows our PICO. This essentially has not changed since we last spoke with you. Uh, we are looking at a population of age 65 years and older. Intervention vaccines will be trivalent or quadrivalent high-dose inactivated, adjuvanted inactivated, or recombinant vaccines, either U.S. licensed or similar in formulation or manufacture to U.S. licensed vaccines. Comparators would be other trivalent or quadrivalent influenza vaccines, Again, the same stipulation, U.S. licensed or similar, similar in formulation or manufacture to U.S. licensed. Non-influenza control vaccines, placebo or no vaccine. Outcomes are where we've had a bit of an update since we last spoke. Um, we had, when we presented this at the last meeting, we had pretty much settled on efficacy outcomes. Safety outcomes are a bit more complicated and required a bit more discussion. Much of the discussion centered around lumping versus splitting. Um, there are many ways you can enumerate uh, the safety events. And this is what we ended up with. We have a total of eight outcomes in addition to three intervention vaccines. For efficacy and effectiveness, all influenza A and B, so all types and subtypes, influenza-associated outpatient and emergency department visits, influenza-associated hospitalizations, and influenza-associated deaths. This is largely similar to when we last presented. For safety outcomes, we've settled upon any systemic adverse event, grade three or severe or higher, any injection site adverse event, grade three or higher, any serious adverse event or SAE, and Guillain-Barre syndrome. Now, in addition, we also have some secondary outcomes to the extent data are available. The following will be summarized. Influenza-associated outpatient and emergency visits, hospitalizations, and deaths stratified by influenza virus type and subtype, as well as serious adverse events or SAEs judged to be related to study intervention. Inclusion-exclusion criteria are similar to what was presented previously. Just to resummarize, we'll be focusing on peer-reviewed literature without a language restriction. We are focusing on publication dates from 1990 forward, and, and this was selected based on the licensure dates of the various vaccines in the United States, as well as the fact that um, the vaccine that's been in existence the longest, even though it was not licensed here until later than high-dose vaccine, um, the adjuvanted vaccine was licensed in the EU in 1997. So we decided to go with 1990 in order to have um, some advanced time for reports that came in prior to that. Main inclusion criteria um, for study types, randomized studies, both individual and cluster randomized, retrospective case control studies, traditional and test negative, prospective and retrospective cohort studies. Main exclusion criteria um, would be data involving influenza vaccines not licensed or not similar to vaccines licensed for use in the United States for persons 65 years or older. Studies are data for which the entire population falls outside the age range of interest. Studies are data assessing monovalent or bivalent vaccines. Case reports, case series, and registry reports that don't have comparator or denominator data, animal studies, and interim reports superseded by final reports. So the protocol was, um, the outcomes were finalized during November. The protocol was finalized during December. We began screening literature during January. We have a substantial number of reports to screen, um, upwards of 8,000. And uh, we basically will present these uh, we we'll present these findings as soon as we are able. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Groskoff. Questions for Dr. Groskoff? Uh, Dr. Lee. Thank you so much. I, first of all, thank you for continuing on. Um, it's a huge amount of work, and especially with yes. everything else going on, I uh, really appreciate you moving this forward. One of the questions I have is, it, um, and this is not maybe it's maybe for the work group to think about, which is that it seems like we might be headed towards a question about a preferential recommendation, um, the way it's set up. And so uh, two questions. One is, um, 
Number one, you know, what is it going to be a cleaning, clinically meaningful difference, and will the work group kind of opine on that a little bit to say if there is a difference, how much of a difference should there be? It may or may not be statistically significant, but it may be clinically meaningful. And then the second question I have is around um, determining comparative effectiveness conditioned on the same season, because my assumption is you're going to have so much data over multiple seasons that that comparison is going to be really challenging for different vaccines if you're mm -hmm. talking about different seasons. Um, both really good questions. Um, we have not defined in the protocol a clinically meaningful difference, and a part of the reason for that is I think we're all aware at this point of the variability of the way flu behaves and the way VE cannot be the same from season to season. And even relative VE in terms of what we've seen it is not the same from study to study. So it makes it a little bit daunting to try to define a clinically meaningful difference when there are so many things going into the equation that cause variability. Um, so we, we don't have one, uh, simply put. Um, as far as, and that's related, this, the variability alone, we anticipate we're going to see a lot of variability. I think one of the reasons for doing this, and I, I, you know, in the work group discussion, the, the, general, the general feeling about the reason for doing this is people do ask why there isn't a preferential recommendation. And given all of the evolving literature, it's a good time to ask, okay, do we have enough? And if not, why not? And if so, why so? And it, there is going to be quite a bit of variability and we'll just have to see how much. Dr. Foster. Thank you, Steve Foster from APHA. Uh, again, thank you for the presentations. This is, this is some important stuff that we'd like to know, but I was just curious why we did not include flu cell vaccine or the cellular cultured vaccine in this uh, discussion also then as far as the evaluation of it. The, the cell-based vaccine inclusion was discussed. Um, one reason is that um, there were at least to our, our acquaintance more data available for the other three vaccines for this particular age group specifically. Um, it is quite a complicated review already with the three. Uh, to add the fourth would, would broaden things out quite a bit more in terms of relevant comparisons. The cell-based vaccine is licensed for four years and older, and the feeling was that this is likely to be something that would be addressed in a broader review, um, probably perhaps egg-based versus non-egg-based for a broader scope of the population. And lastly, for the cell-based vaccine, we, we have currently, this season is the first season where all of, the, all of the reference viruses that are included in it were originally cell-derived. While the cell-based vaccine has been around for a number of seasons and in terms of manufacturing, the propagation of those reference strains has been since that vaccine was licensed in cell lines, um, the, uh, canine kidney cell lines rather than eggs, this is the first season where all four of the reference strains are cell derived. So it, it was, it seemed best to wait on that for a later review. Are there any other questions or comments? All right, thank you very much. So that draws to an end today's session. Um, we will adjourn and reconvene tomorrow morning at 8.30. Um, for the second day of our of our of our uh, meeting, thank you. <laughs>